Hello, hello, and welcome back to Crit and Crit. I'm still Sint. I'm still Axia. But has everything else stayed the same? The game and book have. We are still playing through Final Fantasy V and reading through Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Our series midpoint, for that one at least. We should be uh, wrapping this one up, though. This should be the last episode for Harry Potter. Before we go on our usual Between Books break. Yep, and for this one, we have a pretty simple topic. Where are we now? So we've mentioned a little bit, uh, just in over the course of talking about how the plot has developed and so on and so forth, that the characters have started to develop and become just their own people a little more, which is as expected if you've been with characters for a lengthy series. And we are four books in, which in terms of the world is four years in. So our little child protagonists were 11 when we met them and are now 14. And uh, if you have been around uh, tweens and teens ever, that is a huge developmental difference. There's going to be some changes going on. So let's maybe talk about how have our main characters changed from their introduction in, sor in a Sorcerer's Slash Philosopher's Stone to the Goblet of Fire. Well, I think the logical place to start is with Harry himself. Let's have a look at our primary protagonist. All right, impressions of Harry as a Sorcerer's Stone. Basically, blank slate. Harry was our, pro our perspective character. We did not see a whole lot out of him. Uh, he was mystified by everything and learning as he went, much like we were. Making his way through this new world... <laughs> Nicely done, Paris. Uh, discovering all of the mysteries of the Wizarding World right alongside the readers, which is not a bad way to write a story. Yep. So, as the series has developed, uh, how would you say he has changed? Is he still the blank slate? He is to an extent, but... Not as much as he was in the first book. He has reached the point where he most certainly has a character of his own. There are things that you could say Harry would do because they would be out of character for him. There are things that you could say would make sense for him to be involved in. Um, he has shown that he has preferences and things that he enjoys that other characters might not. He has friends and enemies that are as much a part of the plot, but also people he doesn't get along with solely because their personalities clash and have nothing to do with who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And... <laughs> Yeah, he has kind of come into his own as a character. Yep, in a little bit more specifics, um, uh, rolling double down on how much Harry liked Quidditch, so he is uh, developed into a fairly popular athlete, kind of middling student, but has a few subjects that he's particularly good at. So we know he's a little bit more rounded there. He's settled into his friend group, and he has a very clear dynamic of how he behaves around Ron versus Hermione versus the Quidditch team. So yeah, I would agree. He definitely has gone from being our uh, easy to project the reader onto blank slate to a more fully realized character while still being a little less overt in his character traits than those around him. Yep. Enough so that you can still see him as a stand-in, but enough not so that he still feels like he's on camera. Yeah. He's also gotten a lot heavier burns on his shoulders, as we would mentioned before with the whole Survivor's Guilt situation and how he keeps ending up being the one who has to save the day and solve the problems. Which is a lot to put on anyone, let alone a teenager. So, 
He is still recognizably hairy, though, which is good. Yep. Who would you like to talk about next? Well, I mean, the logical person to go to after Harry is Ron. The next major character we were introduced to, uh, as far as students of Hogwarts. Yep. So, at introduction, Ron was um, introduced to having more of a temper than Harry, which easy to do when Harry's didn't really, you know, have much emphasis on it. Very class conscious, uh, conscious due to growing up in extreme poverty, in fairly extreme poverty, as we've seen from how the Weasleys uh, react to any worry about finances. Um, large family often felt very overlooked. He's the youngest boy, so even his younger sister, the only girl, probably gets more attention in uh, any given day. <sighs> Just as obsessed with sports as Harry, so we get that pretty early on. I think Ron has probably stayed more consistent. He had to, since he already had a fairly clearly defined personality, he didn't really have to establish one the same way that Harry did. He's kind of deepened as a character, like we got the hidden depths with his uh, chess abilities and so on and so forth, but I don't think Ron has changed in quite the same, to quite the same degree that we can say Harry has. Ron's remained pretty constant. Yeah, I'll agree to that. Ron is probably the least altered character of the group. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, a static character is very, very useful in a cast of dynamic characters because it gives you a clearer baseline. One second. Hello, puppy. So, to continue while she's dealing with the puppy... Uh, Ron is our... Our character who has to deal with, uh, class consciousness the most. He is the stand-in for what it is like to be poor and lower class and unprivileged and to have life be tough for you in the Wizarding World. Whereas Harry is a legendary hero, and Hermione, is, who we'll get to next, is the uh, is the brains of the operation, as well as the example for what's it like to be uh, the wizard raised by Muggles, who doesn't have much of the cultural. Uh, context for the wizarding world. I would actually argue that, because Hermione, because she's so obsessed about researching these things, has a lot more cultural context for the wizarding world than Harry, who has who had wizarding parents, did, because Harry grew up an orphan. Yeah, so, fair. yeah, Harry and Hermione are both the outsider perspective in the wizarding world, but Hermione was able to have better access to it, where, while it was, whereas Harry was kept completely isolated. This is Ferris really go down the hole. I thought I'd figured out where the holes were going to be. Yay! Can I equip that? So yeah, let's move on to Hermione. Sure. So, Hermione and Sorcerer's Stone. Hermione and Sorcerer's Stone is the nerdy kid. She is the one who knows everything. She is the one who solves things with brains rather than brawn. She is the one who is Ugh. She's also the stickler for the rules. 
She's the one that complains to the others about how their antics are going to get them in trouble. And she is the one who is always on the teacher's good side. Yay! Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. And I think we can safely say that of the main trio, Hermione has probably had the biggest change by this point in the series. Yes, absolutely. So, as mentioned, first book, Hermione is terrified of them getting in trouble at pretty much all times. Um... And to the point where they are both shocked, well, the boys are both shocked when she lies about why she was in the basement to cover for them. Um, basically, they hurt her feelings and went to go warn her about the troll before she got hurt. Well, she she uh, lied and said, I thought I could handle it because I studied so much in class and saved them from getting into trouble. Um, so I think that was the first time we saw Hermione actually be willing to bend the rules, and that was a rare occasion, but... As of this book, we have Hermione starting to not care or notice that the rules are being abused and therefore she can bend them too. So by the end of this book, we see Hermione effectively kidnapping and blackmailing a reporter. If you had mentioned in the first book that one of the main characters was going to be blackmailing someone, would you have guessed Hermione? I would not. I would have guessed... Probably Ron? Yeah. Hermione continues to be an incredibly good student, very focused on her academics and learning as much as she can about being a wizard, but she's also proven herself to be a very empathetic friend who kind of helps wield the clue bat for Harry when he doesn't know what's going on, provide a lot of the context that Ron forgets to give him, is more socially aware in that regard, even as she still finds herself a little bit on the sidelines due to being that know-it-all Granger. Um, she is a lot more confident in her confident in her appearance, because as you recall, like she's described as being like buck-teethed and bushy-haired, but with this story, um, her teeth shrink after um, Malfoy hits her with a spell, and uh, when Madame Pomfrey fixes her teeth, she just fixes the overbite and doesn't say anything, which uh, probably irritates her dentist's parents, but she said she didn't care. And uh, with uh, getting asked to the Yule Ball by uh, Victor Crumb, she did something to make her hair look different, but she, then she just said, I'm not going to bother with that because it's too much work, but you start to see like she's becoming a little bit less stuffy with regards to books and a little more willing to relax and play things fast and loose, but she's still absolutely putting her schoolwork first. Until she notices all the stuff going on with Rita Skeeter and how that's causing active problems around them, figures out what's going on before anybody, but before like anybody but the Slytherins who were in on it from the beginning see apparently do and rather than go through the proper channels like book one Hermione probably would have by reporting that Rita Skeeter is an unregistered animagus catches her in a jar and decides no no I'm not going to turn you in I'm going to hold it over your head and make sure you never do this again that's some character change right there and it actually happened fairly organically because you can see where she's learning when it's okay for her to want to bend these things. Yep. She doesn't just start breaking the rules out of nowhere. She has... She has reasons for why she does what she does. Ah, yep. crud, that, that so does I... Yep, and I think it's time for a, mo for a brief flurry into who Scent Talks About Musicals again. Yay! Today's musical is Matilda. Specifically, Matilda's solo from the early on in the show. Like Romeo and Juliet was written in the stars before they even met, that love and fate and a touch of stupidity would rob them of their hope of living happily. The endings are often a little bit gory. I wonder why they didn't just change their story. 
We're told we have to do what we're told, but surely, sometimes you have to be a little bit naughty. I think Matilda and Hermione would get along very well. They're both very precocious, very intelligent young women who learn, like, they're not bad people, but they are, when push comes to shove, willing to do what it takes to force a change on the status quo. And Hermione can do that in multiple ways. We see as her uh, ambitions for Sphere develop that she is trying to work within the system, but when the system proves completely unwilling to be worked, such as the whole Rita Skeeter on the Daily Prophet, she will step outside the rules and, quite frankly, do some really, really crazy stuff. Good lord! You could squish her like that. Are you honestly going to... Yeah. I did mean to uh, talk about Spews some during the last video. Ah, oh, well. I'm sure we'll get into it in the future future story anyway, at least in passing. Anyway, uh, anything further on Hermione? Not at the moment. Uh, things I'm thinking about are coming up uh, more in Order of the Phoenix, which I had just finished a reread to get ready for when we discuss that, and I don't want to muddle the two too much. That's completely fair. So, who's next? Well, we've run through our three main protagonists, so I think it's time to get to the secondary characters. And the first secondary character that we're introduced to in the story is Hagrid. I don't know if I'd say that Hagrid has changed too much. Like, Hagrid is kind of a source of stability as one of the first caring adults Harry encounters, and that, that mostly stays. We just learn a little bit more about him, such as the fact that he's half-giant, we know why he was expelled, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. I kind of wonder why they never bothered to rescind his expulsion when the actual heir to Slytherin has been caught, but, um... Plot problems? I don't know. But yeah, I'm not really sure there's we, a lengthy discussion to be had on Hagrid. We did touch on that in a prior episode, I believe, where we kind of said that it's he's kind of reached beyond the point of that really being something workable and the whole... Uh, yeah, but it would let him carry a wand again, is more my point. That is remember, true. Remember what we've mentioned about, like, if you don't have a wand, you're basically unable to participate in wizarding life. Ha. Huh. Yeah, after Hagrid. Uh, next would be. Oh, he has magic back. Where did you get your magic back, big guy? I took it all away from you earlier. Ah. Well, bye. Phoenix. Uh, I'm guessing he has phases where he gets his magic back. Dumbledore? Yeah, Dumbledore would probably be next. Dumbledore is also Again? one of those characters that's... Really not changed a lot because he serves a point as a a stable place in the in the storyline, which I think is going to be somewhat ironic as the series develops. But yeah, Dumbledore is basically the, the backbone of Hogwarts right now. Who just he's kind of there while things happen, and he's gone when he when the plot needs him to be gone. He is probably the first father figure Harry has really had. And that will become an issue later on, which we'll talk about when it comes to Robert. Since we're on ah. Dumbledore, that brings us to the teachers. There's really and, only... Yeah. I think most of the teachers don't really develop. Like, McGonagall is McGonagall, Flitwick is Flitwick, Sprout is Sprout. Like, unless they are specifically featured like Snape, 
they don't really change so much because Snape as a character is very much tied in with like how this how Harry perceives him, whereas the other teachers are very consistent and static f- from Harry's perspective. Snape shifts a little bit here and there and is kind of a secondary antagonist to him. But that remains fairly consistent. It's just the more we learn about like uh, Snape and the Marauders at school, the more we kind of start to find some degree of sympathy for Snape. But it kind of varies from reader to reader as to whether or not it's enough sympathy to make up for the rest of Snape's behavior. Yep. Is it enough to make Snape enough not Snape or to justify Snape being Snape to make him worthwhile and uh to draw back to the conversation about the shipping wars and the uh fandom uh theorizing and stuff between stories back when everything was new i believe this was a major point of contention for a lot of people at the time oh yeah Yes, Snape was basically the biggest source of debate, uh, short of something that would be introduced in Book 6 and then resolved in Book 7, which we'll get to later. We'll get to it then. Which actually, Book 6 is pretty heavily relevant to that, too. Um... The only other thing I could say on the teachers is the fact that there's a different defense against the Dark Arts teacher every single year, so obviously there's going to be changes there, um, which have interesting results. Lupin, I believe, will be the one we talk about most with that, but that can come up later, because I think Lupin com- doesn't come back till book five. Yep. But for the moment, no need to touch on any of the teachers, really, other than Dumbledore and Snape because they're the only ones that actually matter. Well, for our purposes. The others do matter, Like, but I would not say Professor McGonagall is a dynamic character. She is a very, very solid pillar of stability and doesn't really change as a character. Oh, it's Gilgamesh time. Well. Uh, how about Malfoy? Ah, yes, Malfoy. It's kind of debatable on Malfoy, because um, he's introduced as a spoiled brat who seems to always get his way because his dad has money and influence, and uh, he continues to be a spoiled brat who always gets his way because his dad has money and influence, but he learns more and more ways in which he can flex on that. So, um... I don't think at this point in the series, Malfoy has had a whole lot of character depth given to him or development, and I believe that doesn't change until later. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he is growing up, and he is becoming more clever with some of his uh, antics. So I will give him that he is developing, just in the sense of that's not necessarily a good thing. He's not developing into a better person. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Crab and Coil basically have one-note personalities all through the entire series. They're set dressing for Malfoy. Um, Neville. Neville! Neville is becoming more confident and more capable. But. And I actually think that basically started in the last book and really started to continue here. Because, um, if you recall, um, book three, Neville gets brought up first to deal with the bogger because, well,. I think Lupin thought he needed to pick me up, and I think that Lupin helping him through that and helping him use the bogger to stand, basically help him with his fear of Snape kind of helped start Neville's uh, growth of self-confidence. And then in this book, when Professor Not Moody pulls him aside after he freaks him out in class with the Cruciatus curse on the spider um, and talks to him about 
he's heard he's really good at herbology, gave him a pretty good confidence boost, even though we as the reader know that he did that to put the uh, Gillyweed information in Harry's hands for the task, which Harry never picked up on, because uh, if you've ever been a DM for a D&D &D game, and you put clues where the party can get to them, they will immediately leave the tavern and go in the opposite direction to go fight goblins instead of doing the thing that is very obviously what they need to do. Twitch, twitch. Yeah, Nettle's starting to change as well. Um, who else? Uh, let's see what other students are there. more accurate, like, what other students that keep coming up that we've seen over most of the books? Because there, there are a couple that got introduced, like, mid, basically midpoint and not really touched on too much. Right. Maybe Ginny? Or of the other Weasleys? Alright. The Weasley twins. They were kind of a big thing in this, uh, in this book. They have... They've been becoming more and more prominent ever since book two, I think? Definitely book three. Where, yep. uh... They're introduced as just kind of goofy pranksters, and they continue to be goofy pranksters, but with more and more plot relevance with Book 3, uh, giving Harry the Marauder's map, which unbeknownst to them is actually kind of sort of a family heirloom for Harry. And I kind of wonder if Harry ever actually says that to them. I don't know. But yeah, in this book, they also, we really start to see that they are very serious about their ambitions with uh, opening a joke shop, testing their products, and trying to get funds for it through gambling and basically spend the entire book trying to shake down Ludo Bagman for cheating them. Yep. And at the end of this book, they have been given a thousand galleons to op with which to open their, their joke shop, which um, I don't believe they... But, but, yeah, Harry actually tells them, don't say it's from me because I don't want to hear about it, and I just want to be done with this. So, yeah, um, here you go. You have a blank check to uh, create mayhem. Good job, Harry. <laughs> Oh, that's everybody. Oh, I do have a damaging spell I can throw at him. Awesome. Let's see, other Weasleys. Uh, Percy is introduced as um, Randall from Recess and continues to be Randall from Recess, but now he has a government job and is just all about the social climbing and I want to be really important and I'm going to keep talking about my boss, Mr. Crouch. And as one of the twins put it, they'll be announcing their engagement any day now. <laughs> uh, Ginny, we are briefly introduced to in book one. Get to see her a little more in uh, book two as she kind of becomes the uh, plot device manipulated by Voldemort into opening the Chamber of Secrets um, via possession. And we kind of start to see her develop more confidence in, as a character over book three and four, but she doesn't really have much of a focus quite yet. We know she is just as unlikely as her brothers to take any crap from people, which uh, is probably part of the course with most Gryffindors. Yep. But, yeah, I'm not really sure I can think of many other major recurrent characters that, There's uh... the Weasley parents. Oh, yeah, I was, I was still on the students. Um, yeah, they haven't really changed much. They are still very much adult source of stability, and just... These are forces of the status quo, for better or for worse. For them, for better, for the Dursleys, for worse. Yep. Dudley still pretty much only exists as a tool to torment Harry with, and... Yep. Actually, one other character I can think of that we need to talk about character development for. And I'm not sure it's really development. Cornelius Fudge. So, um, Fudge doesn't really show up until book three. He's meant, well, he showed up in book two and it's just like, I have to be seen doing something. People are getting very concerned about the stuff at Hogwarts. So he's introduced as basically just a politician who will do something visible rather than effective. Book three, that kind of seems to be the thing. He's very concerned about Harry when Sirius Black is on. I love this line. Thank you, Gilgamesh. <laughs> I do love Gilgamesh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
he uh, is very concerned about Harry when Sirius Black is on the loose because probably for no other reason than it would look really politically bad for the living symbol of wizarding hope and triumph over hatred to die in, on your uh, watch. So he's very accommodating to Harry, very kindly toward him until book four, at which point Harry points out a fact, more than once return, that is extremely politically inconvenient. So I'm not sure it's accurate to say that Cornelius Fudge has changed as a character, but Harry's perception of Fudge has changed as a character because he's seen a different side of him for the first time. Yeah, and I'll, that'll, I'll, that's going to carry us through. I'll go with that, yeah. But yeah, um, I'm not sure offhand there's many other characters I can think of who have major character development changes that would have bearing on things going forward for us. Because I think most characters have been introduced as just like, here's who they are, and they haven't changed from that in much of a capacity. Like, a few characters got more depth, like the Batil twins actually got focus in this book for the first time, and those poor girls had the worst ball ever. I feel so bad for them. They really did. Yeah, but... Uh, we get a little more characterization from Cho, but she only showed up in the, in the last book for like five minutes anyway during a Quidditch match, and Harry thought she was cute, so it's kind of hard to say that she's developed a whole lot so much as she actually was given lines. Uh, Cedric, same thing, basically, uh, minus the crush, but... Yep. Yeah. And then he died. Yep. So, yeah. I think that kind of covers our midpoint check for the main characters, uh, as we've seen so far. And I think that's a good place to end this until we pick up the series again. Poor Gilgamesh. Yeah, so we'll just uh, sit back and listen to the music and watch Gilgamesh have a breakdown. I don't remember if he just leaves after a certain amount of time or if I have to get his HP down to a certain level. So uh, I'm just going to do both. All right. <sighs> I think this is... This is a good song. Oh, yeah, I love that one, Big Bridge. It's probably one of the most memorable songs from the soundtrack. Final Fantasy's always had good soundtracks. Like, I couldn't name most of them. Oh, looks like he's getting called off. Yep. Now we just wait. Ba da ba ba da ba ba. He didn't have the real Excalibur. Poor Gilgamesh. Maybe it was really in the uh, sorting hat the whole time. We'll find out next time on Final Fantasy Z. I don't know where I was going with that. I don't either. So that wraps up Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And, uh, when we are back next time, that will be us with... Please don't be in a monster in the box. Okay, actual items. Uh, we will be back with a new game and a new... Story, like always. Yep. Actually, I think it's back to the save point. Well, yep, still we can just go ahead and, uh, see you then. Yep. Bye! Have a good time, folks.